Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm delighted to introduce today's conversation between two fabulous members of our community. The first is a longtime friend of the school, Ala Lieberman, who is celebrating this year her 25th reunion from Stern's undergraduate college, where she graduated as valedictorian. Ala is today the senior vice president of strategy and operations at Beacon Platform. And prior to joining Beacon, Ala spent over 20 years in global macro and relative value portfolio management, managing capital for 0.72 asset management for Brevin Howard and Citadel. Joining Allah in conversation today is Ashwat Damodaran, who needs no introduction to the Stern community. Um, as all of you know, Ashwat has taught finance and valuation to Stern students for over 35 years and remains the preeminent expert in the world today on the subject. So please join me in welcoming Allah and Ashwat to today's conversation. A little bit of housekeeping before I turn it over to them. Uh, Ala and Ashwat will be engaged in a conversation for about 40 minutes or so, and then they will open it up to questions from all of you tuning in. I encourage all of you with any questions to share them using the Q&A chat feature. Also, I will note we are recording this session as we are recording all reunion sessions, and we will plan to make all the sessions available to you in the next two or three weeks. So thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, Ashwat. Thank you, Ala. Over to you, Ala. Thank you, Dean. Uh, thank you, Professor Damodar. I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. Um, the first topic that comes to my mind is the topic of inflation. At last year's reunion talk, you said it would be okay if interest rates rise due to growth, but not to adjust for higher inflation expectations. Here we are one year later, and the inflation is definitely increasing. So my first question is, why do you think it's happening? Is it a temporary phenomenon due to supply chain disruption uh, caused by COVID, or is it something more structural that's taking place? I think the first reason we're facing this issue is because we've been far too casual about inflation now for the last two years. In fact, when, when this process first kicked in, of course, the excuse was we're coming out of COVID, and then it was supply chains, and then it was oil prices, and now it happens to be Putin. I mean, you can't keep making excuses when you have inflation stretch out over time. And I'm old enough to remember when inflation was a real issue. We've been spoiled in the US and Europe for about three decades now of low and stable inflation. So when I hear people saying, what's the big deal? What, you know, what, what, how can inflation hurt us? My only reaction is, you must be really young because I remember how badly inflation eats away at the core of trust in financial assets. People think of inflation as something you just pass on. Inflation eats away at trust. It affects the way companies invest. It affects the way investors think about stocks and bonds. And it changes how businesses act out there. So to answer the question, why is inflation becoming an issue? It's because we've, we ignored it as, it as it kept going up. And on your second question of whether it's because of COVID slash supply chain or something structural, the answer is both. I do believe that COVID and supply chains have contributed to at least some of the inflation. But I also think we've done some things that, in a sense, added to inflation. I mean, for instance, you go back to the middle of 2020, we had our first COVID package. There is no way a government can spend $3 trillion and not expect to have an impact somewhere down the road. But in 2020, at least, the argument was we needed to do that. The economy was shut down. Without it, people would be laid off. To me, the original sin here was the $1.9 trillion package that was passed last year. In my view, most of it was unnecessary. It was pouring fuel on top of fire. And if you ask me to highlight the one action that I would go back and take away if I could, it would be to go back and either make that package much smaller and much more focused or not pass that package at all. Because to me, that is at the core of why we're facing the issue we're facing right now. Thank you. So you said the inflation... Um undermines the trust in the financial market. The broad stock market is over 10% of the highs right now, with some high growth technology stock trading much, much lower than that. What is your current thinking on the value of the markets and the future? 
The first thing is, you know, I, I think it'll take a while for markets to get out of a delusion that they've been fed for the last 14 years. And that delusion is that somehow the Fed is in control. This notion that the Fed is, 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 is a powerful wizard of some sort who can set interest rates at whatever they want and make inflation go to whatever it is, is a, is a, myth, is a myth that's been fed by, by, by the, not just the popular press, but by some economists who seem to think that the Fed has the power to go out there and set interest rates and drive inflation numbers. Again, all you need is a perspective of history. If central banks are so powerful at setting inflation and interest rates, why did we have double digit inflation and interest rates? Clearly there are times when things get out of central banks control. So I think for a while now, the markets have been operating in the delusion that the Fed can bring this all back under control. And that's what this year will continue to be a test of. The Fed is not in control. It's following the markets, not leading it. The reason rates are rising has nothing, nothing to do with Jerome Powell saying there might be a half a percent rise in the Fed funds rate. It's got everything to do with worries about inflation. And guess what? If we end the year with inflation still at five or six percent, there is nothing, nothing the Fed can do to keep rates low. I mean, in fact, if you look at what T-bond rates and T-bond rates have done since the start of the year, you can see the inflation fear factor is out there. And once it's out there, it's very difficult to put back into the bottle. Interesting. So, um, so then what factors then, so do you think long-term rates, in your opinion, that's just the expectation, the people's expect, the market expectation of the inflationary, uh, for with inflation expectations? It's the oldest time, right? We can dance all the dances we want, but you look at the history of interest rates and you plot out the history of inflation, it's amazing how closely the two lines move. There are periods where we escape that link, but history suggests that if inflation goes up, interest rates have to go up for a very simple reason. It's just common sense. If you think rate inflation is going to be 5%, why would you ever buy a 10-year bond that delivers 3%? It just doesn't make sense. And I think that's essentially going to be the big force that's going to drive rates. So I think for the rest of the year, we're going to be watching inflation. Everything else is a side story. Inflation is front and center. And that's not a great place for a market to be because you know when, when inflation is front and center, all of the focus turns out to be on inflation. It's not going to be on growth. It's not on employment. So I think the key is to, to, to figure out ways to get inflation under control. There's one way, and nobody's going to like it. It's a Paul Volcker way, which is you break the back of inflation, but the way you do it is you put the economy into a recession. And that's the other thing, the twin worry, the market's worried about, is if the Fed is serious about controlling inflation, that is the only power they have. It's not the Fed funds, right? It's creating an environment where the economy, in a sense, not just slows down, but goes into recession. So we're caught between a rock and a hard place here. And there's no easy escape from this. We have to decide, would we rather face high inflation with all its consequences, or would we rather take our medicine? And that's what it's going to be. It's going to be pretty, pretty, you know, foul medicine to take. Go through a recession and see if that brings inflation down. So, with you describing sort of inflation with growth potential growth slowdown, sort of a stagflationary environment, what are the best investment options in this in this situation? You know what? When inflation, once inflation settles down, we can reprice everything: bonds, stocks. The problem is when inflation is still in flux, it's rising. Think of the 70s. It wasn't just that inflation was high, but it was always unexpectedly high. Every inflation number came in above expectations. And when that happens, no financial asset can withstand that shock. In fact, one thing I ask people to think about is it's not inflation per se you should worry about. It's expected inflation and unexpected inflation. I tell them a world in which inflation is 10%, where I guarantee it's going to be 10% a year forever. It's a world we can learn to live in. Everything will get marked to inflation. The problem is when inflation is 10%, the variance in that inflation is also high. It can be 3 or 17. And that's really what makes it so difficult to invest in financial assets. So the bottom line is, if inflation continues to outpace expectations, and right now, if you look at the at interest rates, people are still 
having fairly benign assumptions about long-term inflation. That's going to come back down to 2.5%, 3%. What if they're not right? If they're not right, there isn't a single financial asset class that's going to protect you. You can go to stocks, you can go to bonds, it doesn't matter. Some stocks you might lose less than others. Maybe you have a company with pricing power, but you're going to lose no matter what, because there's no safe place to hide with financial assets. Well, cash is also losing value due to inflation. Yes, exactly. No. So cash might, you know, so if you think about just holding cash, it's not like you're protected. Any Correct. financial assets is essentially going to lose value while you're holding on to it. Really fascinating. And do you think, in your opinion, uh, the inflation, the high inflation, is this simply um, in the U.S., do you think it will have an effect on the rest of the world or can it be um, just a U.S. economy? I think, you know, it's not just the U.S. that's been spending like a drunk sailor. And, I, you know, that's in, I'm probably insulting drunk sailors when I say that. Every government has used COVID as an excuse to put out these huge packages of spending, as if you can you know, set aside the history of economics aside just because COVID came along. So this is going to be something you're going to see play out across the world, maybe not in the same degree everywhere. Because as I said, the US would be in a much better position today if they hadn't added to their original sin. The original sin was the $3 trillion package, then they added to that, they compounded that sin with that $1.9 trillion package. Other governments that held back, I think, are in, a, are in better shape, so their currencies will do better. But I think we're in for a bout of global inflation simply because governments have not been disciplined. Thank you. Um, taking it um, in a slightly different direction, I would be remiss not to ask about the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Mm -hmm. It has affected so many of us in different ways. For me personally, I was born and raised in Kiev to, to see the suffering of my home country is just heartbreaking. However, besides the human suffering, these developments might have consequence on the general markets. My first question um, to you is, were you surprised by the conflict? No, because it's been a long time coming, right? Since 2014, you, you've been waiting for the other shoe to drop because once we allowed that to happen and there were no consequences, you knew that the wrong lessons would be learned. If you add on top of that the fact that you have a country run by one man with unchecked power, I mean, what do they say? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I think you have nobody in his inner circle that's going to you know, give him reason. So it's a danger of having unchecked power play out. And you could see this coming, perhaps not this year, so maybe sometime in the future, maybe the timing surprise people. Mm -hmm. But I'll be honest, I wasn't surprised when it happened because this isn't a rationally thought through decision. It's a decision driven by impulse on the part of a man with unchecked power. So um, sad. But do you think the market is pricing in the risk correctly? No. Thank God it was Russia invading. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, it's not, I'm not saying that Ukraine is a thing. I mean, can you imagine if China had invaded Taiwan? the world would have essentially imploded, right? The, the, the Russia is a big country geographically, but its economic footprint is tiny. As a percentage of global GDP, it's less than 2%. It's a big natural resource provider. So I think the consequences are going to be more in the commodity markets because that's where Russia has, has its biggest footprint. But if you'd had it, a country that's 20% of global GDP do this. Oh I don't God. think we'd be even talking about this right now. We'd be in the middle of full-blown meltdown in markets. So in a sense, what's what, what at least gives us partial saving here is that Russia's economic footprint is fairly small outside of the natural resource market. And uh, but in, in addition to natural resources, um, or another part of it is since the war began, Russia has decreased its wheat exports mm -hmm. and Ukraine doesn't export anything at all right now. So what do you think the extent of the food crisis due to those factors and what effect do you think it will have on, I mean, on the world? There's a human, human cat catastrophe unfolding, right? It's not just that 
commodity prices are going to go up and people will have to pay more. And you, know, you and I in the US, that might be just an added 2% or 5%. But if you think about poor countries where a third of the food consumed is wheat or rice, this is going to have catastrophic consequences for the poorest among us. If you add on top of that, the 5 million plus refugees that have been created by this crisis, you're creating humanitarian catastrophes here at every level. So economically, we might be able to get through this at relatively low cost, mm -hmm. but the human cost uh, consequences, I mean, are, are, are going to be potentially catastrophic for those who are least able to protect themselves. I mean, it's, uh, it's estimated that I think the number of people who will slip into poverty this year will wipe out 10 or 15 years of potential gains that we might have had with global growth, pushing people out of poverty, they're gonna get pushed back. And that's, I think, a cost that, that we're going to bear globally for the, for the next decade, probably. Not longer, it's amazing. Another area related to Russia in a completely different way, to which I would love your thoughts on is ESG. So you have been quoted in the news as of late saying that ESG is a field of scam that is neither helping investors nor making the world a better place to live in. However, many have argued that ESG investment would insulate investment from bad company behavior. So observing the ESG performance since the crisis, do you believe it's true? No, you caught me at my more, more polite times when you when you when you <laughs> use those quotes because i think esg is beyond a scam i mean this is i think uh, I mean, i've never seen a concept more oversold and overhyped than this one and it's a concept that's going to create real damage to businesses and economies and to the society it claims to be looking out for i mean they, i can't think of a single good thing to say about esg so I could list off all the terrible things, but I'll tell you the four basic building blocks for why ESG was never a good idea and why it'll never be a good idea. First, this notion that goodness can be measured is nonsense. I mean, think about it. You walk around your neighborhood and you ask each of your neighbors, tell me what, a, what makes for a good person. I'll wager for every 20 people, you're gonna get 20 different visions because goodness reflects your culture, where you grew up, your family values, what you brought into the system. And for those people who say ESG is a measure of risk, that's not true. I mean, ESG people just keep making up stuff and expecting the rest of us to go along. If you look at the relationship between ESG scores and any measure of risk you want to come up with, I can, cannot think of a single risk score where you can back up the notion that somehow buying good companies is going to get you less risky companies. In fact, if I were advising companies in the goodness measure, I'd say, just don't be bad. Beyond that, there is no additional value with being extra good, at least me. Second, the notion that ESG will increase your value as a company, I find almost laughable. I live in this dimension. I think about value all the time. And I have a very simple proposition. I state my valuation class. It's called the it proposition. If it does not affect the cash flows and it does not affect risk, it cannot affect value. So my question with ESG is, where do you show up? Is it as higher revenue growth? Is it as higher margins? And I'm unable to find a single advocate of ESG who can give me an answer that actually makes sense, that holds up to scrutiny. Third, and this is the biggest lie of all. You go to investors and you tell them, you can be good and also earn higher returns. Come on. The history of humanity suggests otherwise. Through the history of humanity, being good has always been the more difficult path. Being good has required sacrifice. If being good were easy, we wouldn't need religion. We wouldn't need the Ten Commandments. Being good has always been more difficult. So when you're good, you have to give up something. So if you're going to be an investor who values goodness, at least be honest with yourself and say, look, I can't make as much return as I could have otherwise, but I'm okay with that because I don't want to buy tobacco companies. I don't want to buy fossil fuel companies, but don't tell me that you can be good and earn 50 basis points more at the same time. And finally, to the notion that ESG helps society. Remember that engine one success, but one of the ESG's biggest successes, engine one, of course, was an activist fund that got Exxon Mobil to divest itself of some of its fossil fuel reserves. Everybody celebrated. The key word is divest itself. 
they sold them. My question is to whom? You know, in the last decade, private equity funds have invested at $1.2 trillion in fossil fuel reserves. So when Exxon Mobil sells those reserves, they don't get shut down. They get sold to people who are far less scrupulous about developing these reserves. You know what we're doing with the SU? We're taking our problems. We're pushing them behind the curtains. Say, I don't see them anymore. The problem's gone away. I'll make a prediction. 10 years from now, we'll still be as dependent on fossil fuels as we are today with the SG. We'll be ringing on and saying, what happened? I thought we were doing good. No, you weren't doing good. You were just pushing the bad stuff behind the curtain, say, don't look behind the curtain. This concept is so full of falsehoods, so full of you know, sales pitches. No, I've been trying for two years to get somebody to give me a good reason to buy the ESG. I've given up. Now, there's nothing out there that I can hear that, that would suggest to me that this concept can be improved. The best thing we can do is bury it. So you're saying if you would like to buy ESG, a company with high ESG score for morale purposes, that's totally fine. But don't do it because you think you're going to get a high return. You know what? If, you, if buying a company with a high ESG score salves your conscience. And why do you need to have your conscience? Because here's what you did this morning. You got into your SUV, you drove to Starbucks, you got your coffee in a, in a cup that you'd got to throw in the trash. All day long, you've been trashing the planet. You come back home, you're feeling guilty. You put your money in an ESG fund and say, look, I'm good now, I'm made up. This is, I think, the definition of doing things that look good without actually doing good. So I think a lot of this is driven by guilt, which is part of the reason so many people in the ESG space tend to be in their 30s, 35, 25. I mean, in a sense, they feel guilty and they say, if I do this, I will feel less guilty. If that's the reason you're doing it, by all means do so. You're doing it for the same reasons you go to church and confess. You know, it's not like you're going to stop sinning, but it gets it off your chest. If it gets it off your chest, you feel better about it, do it for that reason, but don't do it for 50 basis points more. So I think I know the answer to my question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. In the weeks after the war started, many U.S. and European companies left Russia. There is an argument out there that it's because of the ESG practices. Thoughts? Well, let's take let's go back to finance 101. When you look at an investment, you look at the expected cash flows, you look at the risk, and you compute the net present value of the investment. I'll wager that 95% of the companies that had invested in Russia, when they looked at their investments, were looking at negative net. It's easy to walk away from bad investments. It's, in, in fact, it's so easy to be moral when economics and morality coincide. And everybody was so moral. Now, notice the companies that have held back are the companies that actually have something to lose, right? The fast food companies actually have Russian businesses. Goldman Sachs, come on. You expect me to pat you on the back for walking away from Russia? What were you doing in Russia in the first place? You're, elf, help, you're involved in Russians who are interacting with European business people or US business people. That business is dead. Walking away from a dead business is not an act of virtue. It's an act of economic good sense. And that's why I told people, think about the, the other scenario that could have unfolded. If China had invaded Taiwan, do you think you'd be seeing global companies walk away from China. I don't know, I, I think I know the answer, but I'd like you to be honest with yourself about whether you'd see all of these companies walking away from China the same way they're walking away, away from Russia. So this has nothing to do with goodness. It's got, it's got everything to do with the economics. And the sooner we stop lying about you know, what the real motives are, the more honest the discussion will become. Well, let's hope we'll never find out in practice what will happen if China invades Taiwan. But if you think ESG is sort of a flavor of the moment, a popular thing that's going to die out rel soon, let's call it within the next decade, then what is the next big thing after that? Oh, you know what? Don't worry. Consultants and bankers are already thinking about the next big buzzword they can use. In fact, I laid out a five-step process by which you can create the next big buzzword. Here's how it goes. Step one. Think of a good sounding word. It's got to be big and fuzzy enough that different people looking at that word will come up with different meanings for it. Second, 
write a description of this word, Pre preferably make it an acronym. For some reason, making an acronym adds a, a aura of mystery. Second, give it all these qualities that again are fuzzy and, and in the process also throw in that you're gonna save the world. That's always a great thing to add to a concept. By the way, not only are we gonna do this, but we're gonna save the world. Step three, reverse engineer what you will put into this concept by looking at successful companies in the past. So basically what you're doing is you're going back over the last 20 years and let's see what successful companies have done and we'll take the four common characteristics, we'll put it in to our acronym. Step four, play to the self-interest of academics and consultants and go ask them to do some research. And guess what they're gonna find? That your concept works really well in terms of explaining success. Why? Because you reverse engineered it since statistics. You fit something by looking at the data. Of course, it's gonna explain the data. Step five, sell, 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 sell. Because once people now, people's economic interest gets tied to this concept, their capacity to delude themselves become, becomes almost endless. That's basically the five-step process. ESG went through that process. And if it crashes and burns, trust me, there will be another one. I'll throw a candidate out there. I know this is going to piss off a few people. Can I say that word? But I've said it already. It's sustainability. I'm terrified of this word. I know it sounds good. We all, And that's part of the problem. When you have a word that sounds good, people don't push back at it. I have a, and, there, and if you, the most benign version of sustainability to me is it makes you think long term. In fact, I call it, you know, Pinocchio, Jiminy Cricket sits, you know, sits on Pinocchio's shoulder. Good, the benign version of sustainability, you've got a chief sustainability officer who's your Jiminy Cricket, who sits in a company and says, you shouldn't do that. That's not good for you. Now, I know what makes for that person. It's the most malignant version. Sustainability tells companies they can live forever. That's, which makes corporate survival the end mission, which is a terrible mission. Companies are legal entities. The reason for your existence is gone. By all means, leave. Don't hang around. It's not good for you. It's not good for your shareholders. It's not good for society. It's not good for the economy. But there is this version of sustainability, and I blame Har the Harvard Business School or whoever concocted this measure for this, is somehow companies have to be focused on surviving forever. I mean, they remind me of, these, of the old Egyptian pharaohs who wanted to live forever. And they came up with an idea, right? When we die, we're going to get wrapped up in bandages. We're going to get stuck in crypt with all our favorite stuff around us. And guess what? They died anyway. And 2,000 years later, a British explorer came and stole all their favorite stuff. That's what the sustainability does to companies. It converts them into mummies, puts all their favorite stuff around them. And guess what? They're still dead. <laughs> True. Okay, now I'd like to ask you a question about a person who might actually live forever, Elon Musk mm -hmm. and Twitter. What do you think is the motivation there? What do you think is the outcome? Just would love to hear your thoughts on that. You know, to me, this, the, this, uh, the Musk buys Twitter story brought together two of my obsessions over the last 13 years. I've essentially valued Tesla every year. I mean, you know, for Tesla, so for all of Musk's you know, faults, I mean, the man is a visionary. He's got vision coming out of every orifice of his system. He has more vision than the next 300 CEOs put together have. But he's also a teenager. He's, he acts on impulse. He does things. So in fact, when I bought Tesla in June of 2019, I described it as my corporate teenager. I said, like teenagers everywhere, one man in Tesla gets up every morning, looks in the mirror and says, we have lots of potential. What can I do today to screw it all up? Maybe I'll tweet about a Thai diver. You know, how about doing something? So I think with Musk, the one thing I've learned by watching him over the last decade is he's completely unpredictable and you can never underestimate him. I mean, when he came out, what did the other car companies? I will crush him like a cockroach. I mean, this is a small electric car company. Remember what we did to the Del DeLoreans? Against all odds, he's built a trillion dollar company. And not only has he built a trillion dollar company, he's changed the entire automobile business. Every single automobile company now wants to be Tesla-like, even though they never say that. So let's give the man credit. He's, he's disrupted one business. And when he, his name came up, of course, I was interested. Twitter is not quite an obsession, but I tweeted for the first time in April of 2009. 
So I've kind of watched this platform grow, grow up. I valued it at the time of its IPO. And the story I told when I valued Twitter in October of 2013 was I said, this is a, a, a company with lots of users that hasn't figured out how to monetize them yet. You know the story I was still telling in 2022 about Twitter? This is a company with lots of users that hasn't figured out how to monetize them yet. Nine years after going public, this company can't figure out how to convert users into money. Maybe it's something to do with the platform, but maybe it's got something to do with the management as well. So when Musk announced that he was uh, had acquired 9.2% of Twitter, I actually valued Twitter at that time to see, hey, you know what is no what what's Twitter worth? And my judgment was worth about forty to forty five dollars so as a platform that can be monetized, run by the existing management. Now later, of course, you know Musk announced a bid at fifty four, and I I found management's response to be a little laughable. They said, well, Twitter could be worth a lot more run differently. To which my response is, who's been running the company? I thought you were running the company. So if you thought it could be run differently, why weren't you doing it in the first place? You have no credibility on this. Could the platform be worth more? I think so. But I, let's also be real about Twitter. This isn't, I mean, I, as I watched this conversation about Twitter for the, and Musk for the last four weeks, let's face it, this has become a political conversation not a business conversation. I tell people, you tell me which side of the divide you're on, the political divide. I'll tell you what you think about the acquisition. So almost every argument you hear is couched in terms of business, but it's really your political priors driving you to a place. And I said, look, there's a lot of delusion and, um, and hypocrisy on both sides here. The people who oppose must taking over Twitter of course, they look, a billionaire should never be given that much power over a platform. True, but why are you writing in the Washington Post then? I mean, you are owned by a I mean, if you think about media, and then they say, what? Well, not all billionaires, it's Musk in particular, because he, you know, he's got a personality that's not right. If that's true, maybe we should take every media company owner and put them to a personality test. <laughs> so... That side, and on the other side, of course, there are people who think that somehow Musk is going to make Twitter a free speech mecca. The reality is a social media platform can never be completely free speech because you'll have legal issues, chaos. You're always going to be censoring people. And maybe the argument is maybe the censoring will get a little more balanced, at least the people who are for. But the reality is you're going to be, you, you're going to have to cut off people who are saying things. It's like, you know, what was your, what's your old saying about the First Amendment? You can't yell fire in a crowded, you know, crowded square. So in a sense, as a social media platform, you're going to be censoring things. And the other hypocrisy, of course, on the part of people who are for us taking over Twitter is guess where they complain about the Twitter bias? Not on Parler, not on Truth Social, but on Twitter. So there is enough hypocrisy and delusion on both sides here that you got to stop and ask, why am I really for or against this merger? And the answer very simply is because of the political side you came from. So I think there is a business story here that at $54, I can see buying Twitter as a business, but I'm not sure it's a good idea. If I were advising Elon and he doesn't take advice well anyway, I would say, don't do it for two reasons. One is I think he's got a trillion dollar company that he's got to take care of in Tesla. And I think buying Twitter actually puts that trillion dollar company at risk. And I'll give you the reason why. I think the worst thing that Elon, uh, that Jeff Bezos ever did was to buy the Washington Post. Because until he did that, he was under the radar. People didn't know who he was. Amazon was a company essentially that delivered stuff overnight. The minute he bought the Washington Post, he put Amazon, even though he did it with his personal wealth, he put Amazon in the center of a political firestorm. And Amazon still feeling the effects of both sides hating it because of the politics of that particular action. And my worry if I'm a Tesla shareholder is by Elon Musk buying Twitter, whether we like it or not, he might be bringing those political issues into Tesla. And you don't want to put a trillion dollar company at risk because you want a $40 billion plaything. Very good. You just mentioned Amazon. So I just wanted to um, ask you a question about that. 
You previously argued that Amazon stock was overvalued, but it just recently made your buy list. What changed your mind? Well, it's down about, I mean, I did the September 2020 when I valued it live, uh, the previous time. It was overvalued by about 15%. Since then, of course, the stock price has kind of stagnated. It's down a little bit. It's one of the three of the six Fang Am stocks that actually lost value, not as much as Facebook or Netflix, but it's down about 6%. Its revenues and earnings have continued to come in. So the value has gone up. The price has gone down a little. And with Amazon, I'm always looking for a reason to buy. There's a, because I really think that, I mean, I, I think if you were telling corporate stories, I can't think of a better corporate story than Amazon. I mean, it's a story that essentially of a company that started as an online book. I, mean, I valued Amazon for the first time in 1997. I valued it every year since. I've seen this company go from this tiny online book retailer to the most feared company on the face of the earth. I mean, I, and, I, and I use those words deliberately. There isn't another company on the face of the earth that's more fearsome than Amazon because it's got patience built into its DNA. This is a company that will wait 20 years. It'll come after any business with a soft spot. And I, you know, my advice to CEOs is get down on your knees and pray that Amazon doesn't enter your business. Because if they do, they might not figure out how to make money, but I'll guarantee the minute they enter your business, you will have a more difficult time making money than you did before. So I think with Amazon, my story has evolved over time. I bought Amazon five times over the last 25 years. I've sold Amazon four times, which means I'm holding it right now. But this is a company where I come back to it whenever I think the price has dropped enough, and then I have to sell it when the price runs up again. So I mean, that's my, you know, so my story with Amazon is almost personal. Almost everything I know about valuing young companies, I learned in the process of valuing Amazon. Thank you, Professor. As you might expect, we've had a, quite a few questions coming through the chat box. So I'd like to turn to some of those now. Okay. Um, and I'm going to start with one that's actually related to what we were just talking about in Elon Musk. So, hi, Professor DeModron. As a former valuation certificate student and start alumni, my question. If Elon Musk was your student and you chose a company for him to do evaluation, what company that he does not own would you want to get his take on? I'd ask him to value Volkswagen. I want to see how much, you know, how he would value Volkswagen because when I ask people to value companies, I ask them to value companies with the status quo, with the existing management in place. Then I ask them to value the company again with them running the company. I would love to see what Musk could have done at an old time automobile company, you know, because it is entirely possible that if Musk had been put in charge of Volkswagen, he couldn't have pulled off what he did at Tesla, that he actually needed a blank slate to do what he did. And I think it, show, it shows why the legacy automakers might never ever be big players in the electric car market. Because the name that you built up over a century, that was your brand name that allowed you to sell cars might actually become an impediment in the electric car market because people buying electric cars are not buying, buying cars, they're buying electronic devices. So in a sense, having the name GM on an electric car might be the kiss of death. I think GM, if it had named the, you know, if it had created a separate electric car company, the Volt was actually a pretty good electric car for its time. It never made it because the minute you put the word GM on it, your reaction was, I'm not buying a GM electric car. So in a sense, I would love to see how you'd have got over the issue of a legacy name kind of dragging you down. Because it's you know, because the, the, the wisdom now is the regular car companies are run by idiots. Tesla is run by a genius. That's why Tesla won. I think that GM and Ford and Volkswagen might be run by very smart people. The problem is that they're climbing a mountain that Tesla didn't have to climb because of their past history. Makes sense. Um, another question that somebody's asking, I actually am curious um, as well, would be my um, question. When you talked about, uh, when we talked about invest investment alternatives in the inflationary period, we didn't touch on real estate. Um, do you think real estate can actually hold value during the, in, in this scenario, like in this economic environment? In the 1970s, there were only two asset classes that either kept pace with inflation or beat inflation. One was gold, which kind of kept pace with inflation. So you were able to at least hold on to your wealth. 
The other was real estate. I'm afraid though, we've screwed up real estate as an asset class for the rest of time. And we screwed it up with the best of intentions. We securitized it. You know, starting with Lou Ranieri's mortgage-backed securities, we've increasingly, you're saying, so what? Seems to be a strange phenomenon. When you take an asset class and you securitize it, it starts to behave more like stock. In fact, I have this graph that I do in my class of equity risk premiums, stock markets, default spreads and bond markets, and risk premiums in the real estate market, which is the cap rate minus the risk rate. If you look at the 70s or 80s, the real estate cap rate moves in a very different way than stocks or bonds. I don't know whether you remember, when I took my first finance class, I was told the way you diversify as an investor is you put your money in stocks, you put your money in bonds, you buy a house. Why? Because in periods where your financial assets do badly, your, your house will tend to kind of add in value. That's no longer true, right? Think of 2008, your stocks were down 30%, your bonds were down 20%, your real estate was down 25%. Same thing happened in, in, the, in those six weeks of 2020. I think if we expect real estate to somehow protect us against inflation, it's gonna be very difficult to do because as an asset class, we've made it behave more like stocks and bonds. Maybe there is a possibility with the rental income property, if you bought a rental income property where hopefully not in an area with rent control, you might be able to pass inflation through, but the value of your real estate might very much be driven by what happened to stock and the bond market rather than some history from the 1970s that could protect you. You know, it, in, a, in a strange way, what's happening with asset classes, because what's happening is there are fewer and fewer places to run to in a crisis. In the old days, if you, the US was doing badly, you went to a foreign market. Now, if you look at the correlation across global equity markets, it's like 85%, 90%. You used to buy real assets, commodities, real estate. We've ruined our advice on diversification in a strange way has blown up in our faces because we've taken all these asset classes that used to be likely correlated with financial assets and made them all behave like financial assets. So people are desperate. So what do they do? They go to cryptos, they buy NFTs. In a sense, it's almost predictable that you're going to get this boom in these alternative, I can't even call them assets because they're not conventional, alternative investments, because you've lost faith in any kind of investment that could protect you in the event there's a currency meltdown or inflation comes back. Actually, related to a crypto and blockchain, there's a question about what these, uh, your perspective on those uh, alternative investment and where do you see the investment opportunities now? I think, first, I think we need to separate Bitcoin from blockchain. Let me focus on the most highest profile crypto of all. You can have blockchain without cryptos, right? You can have, you can have a blockchain in US dollars, you can have it in euros. Blockchains don't require crypto. We connected the two at the hip because to give Bitcoin credit, it brought blockchains to the front. So you can have blockchain become part of how we do business, and at least in some transaction-oriented business, maybe blockchains are a more efficient way, a more secure way of recording transactions, because it's much more difficult to mess with the blockchain than physical records or even computer records that are filed of transactions. Bitcoin though, I mean, I've written about it multiple times in the last decade. My big question is, what exactly is it? I mean, early on people said it's a currency, but if it's a currency, it doesn't, seem like a very good currency because I don't see very many people using Bitcoin to buy stuff. I mean, 14 years after its creation, it's amazing how few transactions happen in Bitcoin. Transactions is you buying food with Bitcoin, you buying your house with Bitcoin. And part of the reason for that, it's a very inefficiently designed currency where, because you trust no one. I mean, I've described Bitcoin as created by the paranoid for the paranoid, because it's a, you basically trust no one. You need it to be, every transaction has to be crowd checked, right? That's what the mining does. And because of that, it's an incredibly inefficient currency. Could it become more efficient? Yes, but it'll never be a smooth running currency because of the way it's designed. Yeah. And also it's a currency that moves around 50% over the course of three days. I mean, how the heck as a shopkeeper are you going to price things in Bitcoin? Because you'll have to keep revisiting your prices and changing your prices every moment of every day. So it's not been a very good currency. So maybe it's a collectible, right? I mean, I've described Bitcoin as millennial gold, that if you're 30 years old, you don't want to buy gold because that's what your parents did. You're buying Bitcoin. 
Well, the essence of a good collectible is it does well when financial assets are in crisis. That's been goals, you know, selling point, right? When markets are melting down, stock markets and bond, gold hold its value. And you know, in March, between February 2020 and March 2020, when stocks were melting down 35%, gold did its job. It was up 6%. But in those six weeks, when stocks and bonds were melting down, guess what Bitcoin did? It was down 50%. When stocks came back 50%, Bitcoin was up 90%. Hey, that looks like a very risky stock to me, not a collectible. So here's where I am. It's not a good currency. It's not behaving like a collectible. So what the heck are you paying $40,000 for? What exactly do you plan to do with it that gives it value? And that's where I'm stuck because the biggest arguments for Bitcoin that I hear is, look how much money I made trading Bitcoin. That's not a great sales pitch if you're trying to get people to adopt Bitcoin as a currency or a collectible. And unfortunately, that's where we're stuck. Not all cryptos are in the same bucket. I think other cryptos are more crypto commodities and currencies. I think of Ethereum as a commodity, a crypto commodity. And the argument for Ethereum is it's a lubricant that lets your blockchains run more smoothly. That's, I think that's, that's a more legitimate pitch in terms of, say, the, uh, the demand here will come from more and more people switching to blockchains, and it's much more efficient to run them with, with Ethereum than with Bitcoin. So I think first we need to stop bundling all cryptos into one group because you've got this very diverse mix of crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, crypto collectibles, and crypto commodities all out there. And we need to treat them differently because uh, depending on which bucket they fall into. So no crypto, questionable on real estate. Somebody's asking, you did say gold. Any other commodities? You would, would you buy any other commodities right now? Is this still time? Would you put your money in it? The question is, what are you trying to do, right? If you're saying, I want to preserve my portfolio, come on, stop being greedy. You've had 14 good years. Have some perspective. So what if you lose 20% of your portfolio? If you've been saving enough over time, you're going to go back to where you were in 2019. Is that such a bad thing? It's amazing how quickly we lose perspective. You're, you know, you talked about the 10% drop in market. Sounds crazy, right? But I was just looking at my portfolio year to date over the last year. I'm up over the last year because of where I started. But because we're so focused on the last four months, the last three months. So the first thing to recognize is to be realistic and say, look, my portfolio is going to take a haircut. And I'm okay with it. The people I think who will feel the pain the most are the people who entered the market in the last two years, the last three years, because you built up at a peak, a market peak. And if there's a correction, it's going to take you a lot longer to get back what you've lost. That's a history of equities. I feel sorry for the people who started investing in 1929. Just before the, you know, because they never, they did not get back their original portfolio value until what, 14 years later. I feel just as sorry for the people who invest in the Nikkei in 1988. It took them 40 years or 30 something years to actually get back to where they were in 1988. Now, with that, and, and, and it's one reason why I, why I look, you know, I question titles like stocks always win in the long term. It's a nonsensical statement. But you see wealth managers make it every day to people who walk in. Oh, you have a long time horizon. Stocks never lose in, in the long term. You should put all your money in equities. That's because you've got a selection bias. You're looking at US equities in the 20th century. Of course, they didn't lose in the long term because you took the most successful equity market of the 20th century. Stocks can lose even if you have long time horizons. That's why we demand an equity risk premium. Because if they always won with a 30-year horizon, my equity risk premium should become zero if I have a 30-year time horizon. So I think we need to accept the fact that when you invest in equities, you have to be okay losing money. And if you're not okay, then you know what that tells me? You've got too much invest in equities. So related to that, somebody is asking, uh, we are in the bear market territory in tech stocks. Do you think there's further downside? And or, or do you think it's a good entry point? Who knows, right? If you try to time these things just right, you know what's going to happen? You're going to sit on cash for the rest of... I know people who went into cash in 2009 and still haven't gone back into stocks because it's just waiting for the right moment any day now. So here's what you need to do. Forget about what will happen as a correction over. If you think 
you're getting a reasonable value. If you think Netflix at 200 is a good value, given its capacity to generate earnings, go buy Netflix at 200. Could it go down to 170? Absolutely. It's better to leave money on the table and have a consistent way of investing than to try to maximize money made because you never can pull the trigger. Then you're always looking for the lowest point. And guess what? It always passes you by. Actually, related to that, somebody had a question. Um, for us not being active investors, but who do own portfolios, how often do you think it is wise to assess performance and rebalance the portfolios with new valuations? Well, if you set up your portfolio right in the first place, it's a rebalance itself, right? <laughs> because if you're not an active investor, the way you design your portfolio is based on your risk preferences and being diversified. We have no excuse now to not do that. It's not like the 1970s, we had one index fund, the S&P 500 index fund, and then you had to create your, you have index funds on pretty much every slice of the traded market out there right now. I mean, I can create a portfolio. So you tell me basically how risk averse you are. I can create a portfolio composed almost entirely of index funds that will rebalance itself. In what way? Well, if uh, the S&P 500 goes up in 20% value, your portfolio will automatically reallocate based on the value adjustment. The nice thing about being a passive investor who's not trying to time markets, who's not trying to pick stocks, is you can go back to living your life. It's a healthy thing to do. You, it, I mean, if you're checking your portfolio a dozen times every day, should I move the money out of this index fund? You are in a very unhealthy place with your investing. I think, you know, one of the, I think one of the downsides of all of this monitoring we can do constantly of what's in our portfolios is it's leading to worse decision-making, not better decision-making, right? I mean, I, you know, I, in the 1960s, if you put your money in a mutual fund, you know how often you heard about what the mutual fund was doing? Once a year, you probably got a letter from the mutual fund saying, this is what your portfolio did last year. And since you didn't know what everybody else did, you had no idea whether there was a good number. It allowed a lot of bad active money managers to continue to be bad you know, money managers because nobody knew how badly they were doing. In fact, I hear a lot of active investors complaining about the fact that over the last decade, things have become so... You've, I mean, active investing has always been bad. It's only in the last decade that we've all realized how bad it is. And we have choices now. So I think in a sense, the chickens have come home to roost. If you're an active investor, welcome to reality. Don't complain about ETFs and index funds eating away your market share. I'm just surprised you have the market share you have given the history of bad performance collectively in active investing. Um, another question is, what do you think is the likely, likelihood of a recession this year in 2022? I mean, it's, as I said, inflation is the key story. If inflation stays high, then a recession almost is bound to inflation, which is you're going to have a recession simply because that might be the only way to bring inflation down. So I think that I would watch inflation. That's going to give you a better indication of what's happening on the economic front than looking at you know, leading indicators or lagging. Indi I, I've stopped even watching those because I think they've lost their resonance. They're designed for a 20th century economy. And they really don't do much other than tell you, you know, two years after a recession, that there was a recession two years ago, to which my response is, thank you for letting me know. It'd be nice if I'd known that two years ago. So keep your eyes on inflation because that's going to tell you how much danger we are in, in terms of an economic recession. One last question for you is, what is your number one long for the next three years and for the next 10 years? You know what, I, I, you know, I'm a very strange kind of value investor. I don't think I'd, you know, because the old value investing paradigm was just buy and forget. And I've never understood the logic of that. Because if the logic of being a value investor is you buy when the, when the price is lower than value, the flip side of that logic is you should sell when the price gets higher than value. So I did by phase, I mean, I now own five of the six Fangam stocks. The only one I don't own is Netflix, and it's becoming awfully attractive as the price keeps dropping. You know what? If uh, I, I like those stocks at today's prices, 
But if Google went up 50% over the next year, it's out of my portfolio. So it, you know, so that's my reason for kind of holding back. It's not that I don't like the companies in my portfolio, but I'm not in love with the companies in my portfolio. And I tell investors, don't fall in love with the companies in your portfolio. They are investments. They're not cousins. They're not brothers. They're not, you know, parents. They're not, they're not best friends. They're investments. And an investment is determined by the relation between price and value, not whether a company is good or bad. So I have five of the six. They're all my fa favorite children for the moment, but I'm willing to put them up for adoption next month if the price goes up enough. So there's nothing long that I'm attached to in my portfolio long term. So I'm going to hold that company no matter what. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion. On behalf of Stern at NYU, I want to thank you again, Professor Damodaran, for joining us today. And I'd like to thank all of you, our Stern alumni, for joining us and for your support of this program. I encourage you to stay engaged with the Stern community through upcoming Stern alumni events and look forward to the day when we can actually once again gather in person. Thank you and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.